In the city of London today, ancient churches nestle alongside cutting edge skyscrapers. This is the oldest part of our capital, but it's also a thriving modern financial district. How did it come to be like this? The city has been the center of trade since the earliest times. And this was so important that during the Middle Ages, the king gave it the right to run its own affairs. This combination of wealth and power was to have an enormous impact on the way the city developed. Built in the 1400s, the Guildhall was the political and economic heart of medieval London. The name comes from the Anglo-Saxon word guild, which means payment, so citizens would probably have come here to pay their taxes. It was also the meeting place for the men that ran the city. They were businessmen, drawn from the trade guilds or livery companies. There was one for every type of trade within the city, and you can still see from the street names where each one was based. Here inside the Guildhall are displayed the coats of arms and the banners of the 12 great livery companies. They have a strict order of precedence, and this has caused some fierce arguments, especially between the Skinners and the Merchant Tailors. The Skinners banner is right opposite me there, and the Merchant Tailors up above me here. Eventually, they agreed to alternate between number six and number seven, and that's said to be the origin of the phrase at sixes and sevens. The guilds were responsible for quality control in their trades, the medieval equivalent of trading standards. At the guild hall, they kept official standards of weight, volume and length so that you could check you weren't selling customers short. Here, set firmly into the wall, are a set of standard measures, one foot, two feet, and the Imperial Yard. This was set here after Parliament defined the Imperial Yard in 1824. It was really important for the guilds to get their weights and measures right, and there were severe penalties if anyone tried to cheat. For example, if a baker undersold a customer, he was liable to be hauled around the city with the offending loaf tied round his neck. So very often, the bakers would chuck in an extra loaf when he had made a dozen to give you 13 for the baker's dozen. The Guildhall has taken a bit of a battering over the years, and the roof has been replaced several times. When it was bombed in the Second World War, they decided to replace it with Collie Western slate. Now, this isn't normal slate at all. This is actually slices of limestone coming from a special quarry in Northamptonshire. And what they do is they dig lumps of rock out of quarries, out of the ground, and they leave them out in freezing weather so that the frost gets in and starts them splitting. I met David Ellis, who's been a slater for 54 years, to show me how it's done. And so this one's been out in the frost. Yes. Could I have a go at splitting it? You can. There's a little tiny piece there, look, that's very thin and it's, and it's got nice, nicely frosted away. That section there, look. Oh, hey! Look at that. You haven't taken... That's just fallen off? That, well, that's just as it came. So the, fr that's the water's got in mm -hmm. well, and, and the frost has put, simply pushed that slice that's off? That's right, yeah. David made me his apprentice for the day, and I set about making my first slate. Nice and sharp. That's it. Nice and gentle. And shoving, Gen little, gently. shoving the little wedge pieces into the joint. Ah, so the... I'm not trying to split it. I'm... And you're not forcing it. You're, you're just wedging it gradually apart. Right, so little... you... very gently. That's it. Five minutes of training, even from a master, does not a slater make. But after rather a lot of chopping... Look. Let me just give a little touch of her. Success! There. Hey, I've made a slate. No, no, you haven't made a slate yet. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Look at that no, lovely... I've made a big slate. Look at that, it's a lovely colour, isn't it? Right. Now, we've got... what do we do? Yeah. We get the largest slate we can out of that piece of stone. Right. Because we don't want to waste no, it. No, obviously. Right. It doesn't matter what length right. it's going to be. It doesn't matter what width, right. it's just we want the biggest piece of slate okay, we can fine. find. I decided my apprenticeship was over and left the shaping of the tile to the expert, right. who made it look easy. Nice strong wrist. A 
so where are we doing now? <clears throat> so the slates above are going to go there and there, and only this bit, only about a third of that slate is going to be visible. That's it. So yeah, if you look at the roof, in fact, there's three times as much slate on that roof as yes. we can see. Yes. There's been a civic hall here for at least 700 years, but in fact, this has been an important site for much longer than that. You see the black circle, all that black stone all the way around, that marks the boundary of Roman Londinium's amphitheatre. The remains are right underneath my feet, and I'm going down to have a look. By the early 2nd century, Londinium was famous for its wealth of traders, and it was about then that this stone amphitheatre was built. This was an important place for Roman Londoners. They would have come here for big meetings, as well as animal fights, executions, and even gladiatorial combats. Blood was considered great entertainment. This place sat around 6,000 spectators. That's more than the Royal Albert Hall and a good proportion of the entire population of Londinium at the time. Uh, hang on a sec, hang on a sec, chaps. Um, uh, before you kill yourselves, uh, that, that looks very hard work to me. Now, tell me, who were the gladiators? Initially, prisoners of war, and then sometimes wealthy thrill-seekers, and sometimes people did it to pay off their debts. Or not. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, OK. So if you won, you got the money, and if you lost, nobody cared much, because exactly, yeah. you weren't there anymore. Exactly. Oh, that's quite a good idea. Well, it fairly good idea, yes. Yeah, yeah, principle, yeah. So, so what sort of gladiator are you? Uh, I'm a secutor gladiator. A secutor? And a pursuer or chaser. Right. And uh, this is a secutor helmet. Right. Smooth. Guy, where's a ton? It does, yeah. The, oh. the, average, the average weight, they reckon, of the gladiatorial helmet is two to three times heavier than the average Roman soldier's helmet. But you're not meant to be out there for very long. Oh, I see. And the sword, yeah. you have a lot of slashing, yeah. A lot of hacking and slashing blows, because a modern audience expects to see a little bit of that. But the, we think, from the sparse evidence we do have, that thrusting blows are much more common. Ah, so it was all this? Much more thrusting blows, OK. Yeah, yeah. And not, none of this stuff at all? Probably occasionally, but much more in the way of thrusting right. blows. Right. So, suppose you were fighting like this, would it necessarily have been a fight to the death? Not always. Um, an experienced gladiator would be quite expensive. We know that some gladiators were stitched up by surgeons, and, uh, but some gladiators obviously had to face inevitability that they would die. But we also know that people were just sent into the arena to die. They were butchered in the morning. It was almost like a, a, a warm-up act. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Horrible right. thought. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, with luck, one of you might stay alive. At least one of you might stay alive today. Well, I hope so. Yeah, I have to drive home to Basel, and so... Uh, and, well, yeah, you wouldn't yeah. do that very well dead, would you? No, no. Oh, well, well, good luck. Thank I, you very I, much. I hope you survive. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, carry on, chaps. Thank you. With all that blood being spilt in the arena and, of course, the London rain, there was a lot of liquid to get rid of, and the Romans built an extensive array of drains to take it away. And the extraordinary thing is they're still here. Look, look here. Do you see this wooden pipe, a square section wooden pipe with part of the lid still on, to take all that horrible liquid away from the arena, preserved after 1,800 years? It's really amazing. It's very, very rare to find these things lasting that long. And, of course, there was an additional problem. It would have carried with it, the liquid, a lot of sand, a lot of rubbish, a lot of the stuff that the spectators would have chucked into the arena. And all that might have clogged up the drains. So they built this. Look, it's a silt trap. All the liquid would have come down the pipe on that side, the solids will have fallen to the bottom, and the clean liquid would have carried on down the drain this way. And then, maybe once a month, they would have sent a slave down with a shovel and a bucket to clear out the silt, and Bob's your uncle. Or, I don't know what Latin for uncle is. The Romans built the wall around London that defined the shape of the city. The actual street plan within the walls hasn't changed much since medieval times and is often blamed for traffic problems today. But actually, things were no better back in the 16th century. All the vehicles carrying goods on these narrow streets made congestion a big problem and it wasn't helped by the disorder and rude behaviour of the cart drivers. It was vital for the economy of the city that goods could be transported to and from the docks and the markets, so in 1517 they decided to form a Carmen's Guild to regulate the trade. In order to have your cart on the street, 
you would have to bring it to the Guild Hall to be marked. That was the first form of vehicle licensing. The cart marking ceremony is carried out to this very day. I'm sitting in the queue. It's for vehicles that can carry goods or passengers, and I brought my recumbent along to be licensed. Every carman has a numbered wooden plaque branded with the city arms. Each year, a new letter representing the current year is added to the plaque. The brand would allow the carman to ply for hire in one of the City of London's car rooms, which were the origins of our modern taxi ranks. None of the vehicles here today will be plying for trade, as the last car rooms in the city were abolished in 1965. But the cart marking tradition lives on in the form of this colourful ceremony. Ouch. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. And there he is, complete with his little cart marking board hitched on the carrier at the back. And off he goes to make another delivery. London is the financial capital of the world. And most of the activity takes place here in the square mile of the city. The city has been a center of business for centuries and some of the old institutions, such as the livery companies, still have an important role to play. The Goldsmiths Company is responsible for checking whether or not British coins are up to standard. They do that every year at a ceremony held here at Goldsmiths Hall. It's called the Trial of the Picks and is overseen by a judge called the Queen's Remembrancer. This is the oldest judicial post in the country. The trial started in 1248 when the currency was hugely debased and the King wanted to restore public confidence in the coinage that was issued by the Mint and the government. Ever since, a sample of coins has been taken from each day's working at the Royal Mint. These are sent to Goldsmiths Hall in wooden boxes, otherwise known as the picks. There are 50 coins in each envelope. The jurors count the coins and pick one at random for further tests. A simple task, you might think, but this is a legal trial, so every aspect needs to be taken very seriously. The coin samples are measured and weighed and then taken away to be assayed or analysed chemically to see exactly what they're made of. Today, the jury gave a verdict of satisfactory, so you can spend your coins with confidence for yet another year. The goldsmiths were the first bankers. Depositing and lending coins developed naturally out of their business activities. But by the end of the 17th century, it became clear that we needed a national bank, and this was founded in 1694. And here I am, inside the Bank of England. This is the oldest and grandest part of the bank, the parlours. This, the, the courtroom, dates back to 1774. It's where the governing body of the bank used to meet and make important decisions. Indeed, they still do to this very day. And what I really love about this room is that among all the gildings and mouldings and chandeliers, there, up above the arch, is a wind dial. You see the arrow points roughly to south. That means the wind is blowing from the south. The critical thing was whether sailing ships could sail up the Thames. Well, with a southerly wind, they'd be all right. They'd be on a broad reach most of the way. And that would affect commodity prices and interest rates. It was an early market information system. Wonderful. As the bank's business grew, its building had to grow too. Sir John Soane was the first architect to face the challenge of housing a large commercial concern. Instead of building upwards, as we do today, he built out, eventually covering a site of three and a half acres. Round the whole thing, he built this curtain wall, and for maximum security, he built it with no windows at all, which meant that inside, everything had to be lit with skylights, and it's a bit gloomy, all the staff complained. But the fact is that this curtain wall did its job. Nobody has ever climbed into the building over it. 
which is why we can say that things are as safe as the Bank of England. Although there is a story that somebody did get in from below. It was about 1836, and the directors had an anonymous letter from a man who offered to meet them in the bullion vaults whenever they liked. Well, at first they thought it was rubbish, but eventually they were persuaded to go down there one evening. And they were waiting for just a few minutes when they heard a noise and a chap popped up through the floorboards. He was a sewer man and he discovered an old drain that ran directly underneath the floorboards. They were so impressed that he hadn't nicked all the gold that they rewarded him £800 for his honesty. I wonder if I could try something like that. After the First World War, they decided the Sone Bank, mainly a single-storey building, just wasn't big enough to cope with the increasing numbers of staff. Everything within the curtain walls was demolished and rebuilt. The new building went three floors down and seven floors up. And if you look down this wonderful staircase, oh, oh I hate heights, you can see at the bottom there's a bit of Roman tiled pavement. It's another reminder of the wonderful history of the city. This staircase itself is fascinating. If you look underneath, you'll see there's nothing holding it up. It's just stuck into the wall. It's, oh, I, I get quite worried walking down these, thinking the whole thing's going to collapse. It's said to be the longest cantilevered staircase in Europe. And Sam Price here is going to explain to me how it works. So, Sam, oh, you've got your own. We have. <laughs> this is a model of a staircase at Hampton Court. Right. Uh, and if I stick a thread in here, like that, you can see it's quite floppy. Oh, it's very wobbly. Very so, is this a true cantilever? So, this is how a true cantilever would work, but it can't. Right, because the wall is... Because the wall is not strong enough in that direction to carry the cantilever. Right, so the I wouldn't want to walk on that. So, you definitely wouldn't want to walk on that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so how does this stay up, then? Well, now, this stays up by, by each tread sitting on the one below. So, this tread sits on this tread. Right. Uh, the weight of this tread is on the back of that tread. Right, so my weight here goes through this, onto, down onto, onto, onto that onto one. the back of that one. Yes. Which, and this tread is supported under its front edge by this tread. So, if the wall can stop this tread from twisting right. that, the load will just come down the staircase. That's how it works. Do other people get nervous on these staircases? Um, I think people only get nervous when you tell them that they're normally only built four inches into the wall. The, the Georgian and Victorian <laughs> ones go in four inches. Wow. That's that, all. That's terrifying. And isn't then it? people panic, and building inspectors say this isn't all right. And so <laughs> on. you have to explain that they've been there for 300 years and they are all right. So you think it's safe for me to go, go on? I think you'll be all right. Thank you very much indeed. The Bank of England was part of a widening financial system in the city. The Corporation of Lloyds started out as a coffee house in 1688. Frequented mostly by shipowners, Lloyds began to expand into the financial world, arranging marine insurance for its patrons. It's had various homes over the years, but since 1986, Lloyds of London has occupied this striking building at Number 1 Lime Street. During every hour, they do about a million pounds worth of business. It's, it's quite scary, really. In the middle of the room, there's a sort of throne, and the chap sitting there is called the waiter. That's from the coffee house days. And his job is to pass messages on a sort of tannoy system to the brokers. Above his head, you'll see there's a ship's bell. That's the Lutine Bell from HMS Lutine, a ship that sank in 1799 with a cargo of gold and silver bullion. It was insured for a million pounds with Lloyd's underwriters, and they paid the claim in full. Traditionally now, the bell is rung once for bad news and twice for good news. The building was designed by the Richard Rogers Partnership, who had also designed the rather unorthodox Pompidou Centre in Paris. You might imagine that a 340-year-old institution like Lloyd's would want a conservative and traditional building, but instead, they asked for something that would be distinctive and would look to the future. I spoke to one of the architects, Mike Davis. 
How important is it to companies to build iconic buildings? I think it's important. Remember, Lloyd's isn't one company. It's an umbrella for 60 or 70 trading companies. But nevertheless, their world prestige and status is such they need an iconic building. And they actually said to us, part of their original brief was that we want a building which will put us in the forefront of world insurance in the 21st century. Specific brief to us. Right. So there you are. We want a building that's important that's internationally recognised instantly and puts London right where it should be, at the centre of the trading world. What makes it so special? Well, a lot of people would describe it as inside out. <laughs> and the core of the build, of traditional office building is in the middle, with the glazing around the edge here. All the technology is on the outside. Why? Because Lloyd said, we're traders. We don't want to stop trading. They're trading a, a million pounds an hour in here. The last thing we want is men in white coats fixing services in the middle of our building. We want all that sort of stuff elsewhere so they can keep trading. So this is an oasis of calm. You can strip out a complete tower, replace it totally, change all its services, all its wiring, everything, without closing the room for one minute. You can't do that with a traditional building. But noise, noise must be a problem. You've got this noisy escalator. Lloyd said you must match the same atmosphere and feel of the old trading market in the new trading market. That was part of our design brief. So we had to design this room and its acoustic finishes and its noise level so that it reaches 68 dB, which is exactly the level at which you can have a conversation that's private in a big public place, because after all, you're trading ships competitively one against another. You right. don't want the next guy to overhear you. I see, so you need a bit of noise, but... You need enough noise to trade discreetly. As the number of people working in the square mile increases, we need to think of new, inventive ways of building on the limited space that's available. So we're going to see more and more developments like the Broadgate Tower, which is built over the railway lines at Liverpool Street Station. From up here on the 34th floor of the Broadgate Tower, you get a fabulous view of the city. In the beginning, London was built for the merchants and the traders on the Thames, and the city has been run by business and finance ever since. From the earliest guild halls to the modern, wonderful skyscrapers, the skyline of the city has been dominated by the desire of big businesses to build bigger and better buildings than their rivals. And that desire is going to continue for many years to come. <laughs>